Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for hanging in there. It's Friday afternoon, last day of KubeCon. You've made it this far. You just need to hang with us for another half hour or so. And uh, well, we look forward to meeting with you. My name is Mitch Becker. I'm a senior storage specialist with Amazon Web Services. I'm Tom McDonald. Uh, I'm an old Unix and Linux administrator. I am now a storage a solutions architect at AWS. That's a big title. Yeah, I'm not too much into titles. Well, thanks for joining us today, Tom. Yeah. We're going to talk about a number of things today. Uh, the agenda is straightforward and self-explanatory, but I, I had a question for you. What is the CYOA? Is that like cover your Argo, cover your Apache, cover your something I shouldn't say? It's choose your own adventure. And we've got a slide on it in a bit. OK. Outstanding. All well, right. discovering what kind of storage to use very much is an adventure, so I can see why you chose that title. I want to do a quick level set on expectations. So we got about a half an hour. And if you don't know a lot about storage, um, you probably won't come out of here in that short time frame knowing exactly what to do. But I'm confident that in the time frame, we'll give you enough guidance. Well, you'll have a flashlight in your hand, and you can find the answers. So with that, there's just not a quick fix to storage, but you're going to learn a lot today. Well, you know who we are. We've already covered that. But I'm kind of curious, just a quick query. Um, in terms of in Kubernetes, how many of you are using block storage, which is the preceding presentation? OK, fair number. How many of you are using um, object? A little bit of a big number. And how many are using, let's say, file storage in Kubernetes? OK, kind of an even yeah. spread. Uh, perhaps a database or a data warehouse? OK, a bit less, but a fair amount. Excellent. Um, and maybe something else that I didn't cover? OK, that's good. So there's no such thing as stateless. And you might not want to be the ostrich with your head in the ground. Because all applications store state somewhere. Because you might choose to be the ostrich with these cool pink sunglasses because your future's so bright you need to wear sunglasses. And, and if you do, Tom will buy you the sunglasses. I'm not buying pink. I'll buy them orange, maybe. Orange, yeah, you're into orange today. That's I right, see. That's I very am. flashy. So I got the idea for this slide, actually. I was listening to uh, Alex Cherkop. He's the, uh, one of the chairs for the Storage Technical Advisory Group for the CNCF. And it resonated me, so I kind of updated my, my presentation. Uh, because the ostrich is, is something that, that sticks in mind, because we don't want to ignore that um, there's no such thing as stateless architecture. And that was actually a very good presentation. You should check it out on YouTube when it comes out. Um, but the reality is, is there is no such thing as stateless. It's just someone else's problem. <laughs> when it becomes a problem, then it's your problem. So why does storage matter? Well. Persistent workloads are nascent in Kubernetes. We know there's a lot of migration going from on-premises into the cloud. And that data needs to land somewhere. It's going to land in storage. And that storage is going to have a cost associated with it. So there's ways to mitigate the cost and maintain or actually increase performance. And in a subsequent slide in the deck, Tom will get into that, how we uh, increase performance and actually lower cost for customers. So it's important to think ahead and be aware of these things. And also, many uh, modern applications need highly available, highly scalable um, shared storage, which may make a case for file storage. You know, and we'll see. We'll see what path you choose. So some of you might recognize this slide. But since 2016, uh, the CNCF has been conducting surveys. And in 23, uh, they conducted a survey, and they had 59 slides. So I'm actually going to keep you for a lot longer. We're going to go through all of them. Now, there were a couple, though, two exactly, that, that resonated with me. And as you can see here, storage comes in at 16%. And it's uh, what are your challenges in using and deploying containers? You have a much bigger view than I do. So what this tells me, while well, 16% isn't at the top, that's significant. That's almost one in five. And I wouldn't expect storage to be at the top of the challenges. Um, but the fact that there are so many people in here and that I've seen so many people in the other storage presentations, it tells me at least that storage is important. Storage is not just an implementation detail. 
Uh, it really becomes a problem when it doesn't work. Um, yeah, the storage is a challenge. So here's some, some data to kind of support the anecdote that I think we all hold to be true. And then another uh, slide that resonated with me uh, is this one. And to me, this is the most interesting stat at the top, um, which is, what are your organizational plans what are your organizational plans to use the following? And so stateful applications came out on top. I find that very interesting. Um, and just to, to reset, stateful applications are those that need uh, an anchor point for the data. So whether that be outside of containers or if it's inside a persistent volume uh, of Kubernetes like we're going to talk about today, it needs that anchor point. So that makes it a stateful application. But 82%. That means those are real world mission and business critical workloads um, that are, are stateful applications. That is huge. So storage is not stateless. We're gonna talk a lot about storage today, but when you're looking at the slide, I want you to think about persistent data. So I've had the opportunity to meet with dozens of customers uh, in Europe and North America just this year alone. So the workloads that I've listed here are those that came up time and time again. So I thought it was relevant to, to put into this deck. And the same goes for the applications. So in this group, you may be running OSS, you may be running uh, something proprietary, or something homegrown for a bespoke application that your organization solves. So think about that. Because what I want you to, to take away and just kind of let drift in the back of your mind are your workloads uh, containing uh, stateful, stateless data, or maybe a hybrid of both. Just, just keep that in mind. I've laid the groundwork that stateful applications are nascent in Kubernetes. We have this vast ecosystem of open source software. You're all aware of that. Now, k 8 offers extensibility into storage. So what drops in here is storage. And it's important and, and worthwhile noting that there uh, is extensibility into file, object, and block. So I've kind of given you the framework of things that you should think about and keep in mind uh, as Tom kind of dives a bit deeper um, and takes us on that, that journey. And so, uh, I guess if we're gonna go down a path, would you take us down that path? Okay, Mitch, thanks. That. Where are you heading? So if you've been in any, the other sessions, some, the next two slides are gonna be a review, potentially the next four. Um, these are not our tenants. They're, they're, Mitch and I didn't come up with these. They're part of the community. You can certainly see them. Um, throughout, the, the first tenet here that we want to speak about is that persistent data, or I'll call persistent storage from now on, needs to live outside the life cycle of the pod. So that's really important. And many people are aware of that, but you can think of a database that might be the simplest view. Um, when you have a pod running, containers in and of themselves are immutable. So if they go down, the storage that's with them is gone. So having persistent storage in that scenario is very important. The second is that the storage needs to be available to the entire cluster. So every node within the cluster should be able to access this persistent storage. Now, since we're talking specifically about cloud in this conversation, there's a nuance there when you're architecting a solution, which is locality. You may be building a cluster that spans locations, which introduces latency and introduces different services that are gonna be available and optimum. So it's something to keep in mind. The third is the storage needs to be highly available, resilient, and durable. And so that's critical in the event that there's a node failure within the cluster, that the data is stateful, it persists throughout any particular crash. All right, so I'm gonna skip forward here a little bit. So there's a lot going on in this slide, a lot. I'm gonna start at the very bottom, which has the storage in there. So one of the foundational things to remember is that persistent storage should be, is outside the cluster period. Um, traditionally, Kubernetes administrators would provision volumes 
either working with their enterprise storage team or on their own if they had you know, the storage responsibilities, and they'd integrate them with the clusters, bring them in as persistent volumes so that they could be consumed by the developers. Now, I've yet to meet an administrator that really enjoys doing that. Um, a few years ago, I was, they had the introduction of storage classes and thus the container storage interface drivers. And what this gave the administrators the ability to label the storage to where volumes could be dynamically provisioned on the fly depending on what the needs of the de developers are. So you could imagine a storage class of gold, one of silver, one of bronze, that has different performance characteristics. So gold being really fast, bronze being kind of slow, and the developers always taking gold. Right? It's just happens. I could also envision a storage class of backup or non-backup for a production database versus one that's in a test environment. So there's really meaningful labels that um, stored or Kubernetes administrators can apply here. Next up is persistent volumes. So I'm going kind of down the stack. Persistent volumes, be it static, as I mentioned before, where the administrators are statically provisioning them or dynamic, are cluster-wide resources. They're not associated with the namespace. And these are kind of where the mount options are set. So if you're familiar with you know, file systems, you may be setting particular flags on it. If, you, if you're doing an NFS file system, you may be setting um, R size or W size. And the last is the persistent volume claim. And so this is a way for developers to claim the volumes that exist within the cluster or create them dynamically through declarative language, which they don't have to know about the back end of the storage whatsoever. So it's a great way to have a consistent view for developers to consume storage regardless of what that storage is. So the next couple of slides I'm gonna go over are, I saw everyone raise their hands on file, block, and object. It sounds like everybody's familiar with that, but we're gonna be covering those from a basic perspective. Oops, I went ahead one. So the title of the presentation was Object, Block, and Storage. I'm a file guy, so I'm gonna call it File, Block, and Object. Is that kind of a potato, potato thing? It is. I mean, tomato, tomato? poison. Right. All right, call it whatever way you want. Yep. Fine. So file is, it's been the de facto interface for data for a very long time. And that's changed recently. But for many decades, file's been available. Um, some of the characteristics, it has a hierarchical namespace, a hierarchical structure, which is really important. It has directories with directories of directories. There could be files uh, embedded in there. It does cause some limitations when it comes to scale. Um, so there's been some introduction of new technology over the years. Um, but file is not nascent. It's well known. Uh, programming languages from Fortran to Golang can, uh, Golang can access files. We see these prevalent in many workloads. If you're refactoring applications into Kubernetes, especially if they're proprietary or enterprise applications, it's a very good chance they're using file. Um, <clears throat> block, I guess the, the easiest way to like visualize block, to me, in my mind, is a hard drive or, or an SSD. You can also think of block as you know, a contiguous set of blocks, all uniform of the same size, aggregated to a specific capacity, shared to a pod as a volume. But either way, <laughs> this provides kind of a one-to-one -one nature, generally speaking, for pods to access data with low latency and high individual throughput. There are new technologies and techniques that allow multi-attach on block. So if you have some read capabilities, look up multi-attach block. It's pretty interesting. One of the fundamental differences between block and file and object is that block has no notion of metadata. So we often see a file system laid on top of block. But there are applications like databases, for example, that can natively access the block devices for really more direct access to the data. Oh, I skipped ahead. Uh, the last is object storage. And if anyone was here for the last talk, um, it, it was a much deeper dive than what I'm going to do, do here. Object storage itself is 
very different than file in the aspect that it has a flat namespace. It's not hierarchical in nature. Um, the UUID, the metadata, the payload is all part of the object itself. Even if you build out prefixes to make it look like a folder structure, it's actually a flat namespace under the hood, single objects. The um, application interfaces are different. The general use case, and what's been going on for years, is um, access over RESTful APIs using gets and puts and lists to the objects uh, to be able to consume them and do work against them. There are some more uh, modern mechanisms, if you will, that present objects as file systems, and we'll cover that briefly in the next slide. So the CSI drivers for file, block, and object um, serve, again, a great purpose in allowing to dynamically provision these services based on what the applications require. In the file system space, we commonly see this in a one-to-many type environment where you have a need for network attack storage, traditionally NFS in a Unix or Linux environment. Um, are there any Windows container developers here? Not a one. OK, cool. Um, <laughs> if there were, that's where you'd access SMB, right? That is really telling. Is there something too. you want to say now that you know there's not? Uh, no, I'll be quiet. Okay. Well, what I will say, what took us so long is we got a system update five minutes before on Windows. <laughs> yeah, that's what we were doing. And we got stuck. <laughs> yep. Um, <clears throat> with, there's also access to parallel file systems. Luster, for example, is one that's coming. So if you have any high performance workloads, if you have any generative AI workloads, we're seeing adoption in that space with regards to Luster. The block, um, block CSI drivers provide the ability for the developers to land those really low latent, high throughput block devices for their workloads. The interesting thing there is you, if you look at the third party CSI drivers for block, you can actually extend into the service itself and do some of the service capabilities outside of Kubernetes snapshots from the service side, things of that nature. And I have object on here. So we're talking about file systems with the CSI driver. And recently, object has developed Fuse implementations. Now, you notice I'm not talking specifically about any service or any provider. There's multiple Fuse implementations depending on the object store. So <clears throat> this is a great way for applications that speak file to access object. It depends on what the requirements of the application are. So be aware that Fuse-based CSI drivers are not fully POSIX compliant. So in the event that you need atomic operations, if you need to rename something, if you need to do a hard link, um, I suggest you go read the documentation, realize that that's not a capability that exists today, and see if this can actually work for your application. Well, before you jump in, I'm kind of curious. Now that you've talked about file, object, and block, would any of you change your answer in terms of which you use for your applications? Anyone? OK, good. OK. So this is my call out <clears throat> to go look at be um, best practices. So on this slide, this is some work that was done with a, a high concurrency application, hundreds of nodes, thousands of pods. And what we were having is a throttling issue. So on, on the far left, you can see, uh, the, sorry, the y-axis is milliseconds for the transactions, the x-axis is time. And you can see this high latent event that's happening. That's on a single bucket. There's no prefixes underneath it. So all the objects, all the activity that's going on it is on a single bucket. One of our best practices, and this is published, it's publicly available, it's nothing that's hidden, is to pre-partition your buckets for, for performance. You gain TPS. So in this particular instance, if you look on the right, um, this was partitioned with 20 prefixes. And if you're not familiar with object, a prefix it would look like a folder maybe. It's not, but conceptually it's kind of the same thing. And what we were able to do here is improve the performance significantly. You can see in the chart the percentages. I don't have them memorized but it reduces the time to result. 
So Mitch was talking about cost earlier. The cost to the storage here is exactly the same. The API calls, the, the amount of storage kept. What the reduction opportunity here is, if you're not using that compute, do you turn it off? Because that's what can be really expensive sometimes. The next one, I, I'm saying follow blogs, and I really should be saying follow the community here. So there's a lot of documentation out there on problems that have been solved. Now, I mentioned I'm a file system guy. I've done an extensive amount of work with Lustre in my career, and this was a Lustre problem. The problem here was this application would read a PCAP file, it would do analysis, and then present some results. When we scaled this out, we ran immediately into some performance problems. So it, after we kind of looked under the hood, we saw that this application was using M-mapping to access the file. Through some research and iteration, um, we looked at the read-ahead flag, which this is a client setting, so this can be implemented on a, on a pod easily. So by default, in this version of Luster that we're using, the read-ahead for the file was 64 megabytes. The files itself were between five and 10 gigabytes. So we settled on one gigabyte for the read-ahead. So what the read-ahead would do, it would tell the storage server on the back end to go ahead and prefetch data. We've got somebody coming with a read, heat up the cache, let's get some performance going. And we were able to reduce the same workload, it was 16 systems, uh, by 27%. So again, kind of the same, the same notion as before. You're not actually changing anything on the store side other than some tunings and some tweaks. The cost is the same, but you're reducing the amount of compute time you have. You're reducing the time to result. So this is where you know, storage becomes meaningful. On this particular slide, what I did want to call out, what's in red, is most of these file system settings can be set in a storage class or a persistent volume. They're documented, it's well documented. When you get into some file systems that may be nascent to you, Luster, for example, if you haven't used it, there's a lot of tunings that aren't set as a mount option. And this one has to be set with an init container. So if you're looking specifically for tunings and tweaks, be aware that there could be other places to find them other than just the documentation of the CSI driver. Going back to the prior slide, I was talking about um, best practices. We have best practices. If you have pods that need high memory and many cores to run an AI application, for example, we have best practices to increase settings. They're not here, but max RPCs in flight, max dirty buffers, which would be implemented within this particular init container. So it, it's something worth dig digging into. Here's your favorite slide. So when I was a kid, um, I read a lot, a lot. And two of my favorite books were Choose Your Own Adventure and Endless Quest. I'm sure most people here are familiar with Choose Your Own Adventure. Uh, it was a book you'd go through, you'd go to page eight, and you know, Tommy may, may si uh, save his dog Griff. You flip through, if you, if you chose to go to page 16, uh, Griff actually saves Tommy from falling into the well. But it's one story. Even though you kind of choose through and you go to different paths, there's a consistent story throughout the whole book. Endless Quest is published by TSR. It's based on Dungeons and Dragons. I still play Dungeons and Dragons today. That's a shocker. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Second edition, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, where was I? <laughs> This is great, I, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so I, I still play today. But one of the fundamental differences, the books were really similar, really similar. But Endless Quest, inside of it, would have a whole bunch of meaningless side quests. Like, you're like, what is this about? It's not about the story. You know, so you know, most of the time, Tommy would find the treasure, but a lot of times, Tommy would just die. It was not good. Um, so why do I say that here? Storage is really easy until it isn't. So if you're in this 
issue where you're not sure what your applications are doing, what your workloads are doing. It's time to start building a decision tree and kind of understanding what the capabilities are. So on the very bottom of this, you see cloning listed. Cloning's a well-known implementation detail for a lot of build farms. They save money by not having to have multiple volumes. They can clone them and read them and reduce their time to solution. And snapshots, snapshots are not a backup, by the way, but they're a healthy part of a backup strategy. Um, whether it's dynamic or static, that's gonna be an organizational decision. But as you walk up this tree, we start talking more about like workload and implementation details. Do you know the read capabilities of your application or is it more write? Does your application have a throughput requirement that, that's being blocked by a TPS issue? Do you have strided reads? Do you know that? Um, <clears throat> do you have a requirement to have a DR copy? So there's a lot of different items there that are kind of difficult to find, but it's, the more you map it out, the better chance of success you're gonna have. And then there's the cost. There is no F in the word cloud, all right? Period. Uh, and the reason I bring this up, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but if you look at any well-architected framework that exists, all of them have cost optimization there, and there's a reason. Pre-planning and architecture will help reduce the overall cost. Then, the observability on the back end can help identify waste. Perhaps you have a snapshot that's orphaned. Perhaps you have a, a, um, an upload, a multi-part upload that failed, but it's left objects. These are real things, and they're real cost to organizations. So cost optimization is a huge part of this story. So <clears throat> just to kind of wrap this up, I guess at the end of the day, what I'm saying is you, you want to choose your own adventure here. You want to be prescriptive on what your applications and workloads need. And what you don't want to do is go on a side quest without any mission and have it be endless. So Mitch, I'm going to hand this over to you. Okay. So you're saying there's not one size fits all? That's correct. Imagine that. You have choices. So to, to wrap this up and bring things home, there's a lot on the slide, and uh, I'm not going to make you read it, but you're certainly welcome to. But I'd like to kind of summarize some, some key takeaways. So first of all, there is you know, no one size fits all. Persistent workloads, as I demonstrated, they're, they're nascent and storage has significant deployment costs. A couple takeaways that you want to share? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, I want to thank the audience for the privilege to present in front of you. Um, it's really meaningful, both to Mitch and I, and we would love your feedback, um, good, bad, or hopefully good. Um, my key takeaways are, if your organization is not using CSI drivers, research them and use them. It's gonna make your life easier. It's gonna make your developers a lot more happy. <clears throat> My other takeaway is that there is greatness in the agency of others. So look towards TAG, look towards the CNCF, your peers, your partners in the community. Your problem may have been solved or you may be able to help somebody solve a problem. So this is a huge part of the story here while we're at KubeCon this week. And um, I just wanna reinforce that point. Yeah, to that end, the uh, QR code uh, will take you to the, to the storage tag, and I invite you to do that. I think joining the tag will embed you in the community. If you're not, there's a lot of resources there. Uh, there's an extensive number of Slack channels, so you can go ahead and put out questions, and you can help others with questions. So it's, it's all part of this community and this, this ecosystem. That'd be my other uh, quick takeaway. So yeah, in terms of getting your feedback, um, Here's another QR code. I'd love it if you'd fill out this survey because we do want to hear what your feedback is. So please take a moment to do that. And I want to thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll, uh, you have our email addresses here. You have our LinkedIn accounts. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take questions through that method. Um, and with that, have a great Friday afternoon. Thank you.